Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to give a, a short introduction in Arabic and I'll translate to uh, English after that, inshallah. Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ufiru wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina wa yahdihillahu fala mudilla lah wa man yudlil fala hadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh usikum wa nafsi bitaqwa Allah amma ba'd fa inna asdaq al hadithi kitab Allah wa khayru al hadi hadi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharra al umuri muhdathatuha wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a wa kulla bid'atin dalala wa kulla dalalatin finnar we start by praising and by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because all praise and all thanks are due to Him. We seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us, and we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection. Protection of evil that may be within our own self and from the consequences of our sins and wrong actions. We know that whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them then none would be able to misguide them. But similarly, whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves them to go astray, then there is none that would be able to guide them. We bear witness and we testify that there is no one and there is nothing that's worthy of being worshipped except Allah, the creator of all things. And we bear witness and testify that his last and his final prophet and messenger is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would advise, would remind at the beginning of every speech that the best words and the most truthful of speech are the words of Allah himself, the Quran. And the best example, the best role model is Prophet Muhammad The worst of affairs in this religion are those things that people have tried to add or innovate in acts of worship and beliefs. Why? because they're forms of misguidance which would lead to the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from it. Brothers and sisters, with Ramadan fast approaching, it's a bit late to have a talk like this. Yeah? Preparing for Ramadan, getting in the mindset of Ramadan. To do so now, it's considered a bit late. But inshallah, it's never too late. We haven't started our first day of fasting, and we hope that perhaps this can remind us about the importance of Ramadan. Uh, my assumption is that the audience is entirely Muslim. There may be some that are not Muslim, I'm not sure, but I'm speaking from the perspective of those that have some information already about Ramadan. If there are those that don't know, then please bring it up in the question and answer, and I can give a brief introduction about what Ramadan is all about. But this talk will be geared towards those who have lived through some Ramadans in the past and they perhaps didn't take advantage of Ramadan as much as they could have or as well as they could. The question that every Muslim should ask themselves when Ramadan comes is how many Ramadans have passed in my life thus far? Depending on your age, depending on how committed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you were, you may have fasted 5, 10, for those of us who are older, 15, 20, and so on, we could find that a number of Ramadans have passed. Now, Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam. And it was not selected to be one of the pillars of Islam for no reason. The pillars in any structure, in any building, they are what holds that building up, meaning the building cannot exist without them. So the pillars of Islam, they are the found foundation, the fundamental elements of the religion. And the month of Ramadan, similar to prayer and the other pillars of Islam, they are actually institutions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about prayer, He doesn't say perform prayer, He says establish the prayer. So there's a long talk we can give about what does it mean to establish prayer properly. It's not merely you physically perform the prayer, no, it's much more than that. So similarly, Ramadan, it's not merely, I didn't eat, I didn't drink, and that's it. I left Ramadan, I lost a couple kilos, and that was the entire benefit I got from Ramadan. No, definitely not. 
Ramadan is an institution. Now this educational institution, when you enter it and you leave it after a number of years, definitely you don't expect to leave the same as you came in. The hope, inshallah, your parents are spending a lot of money so that you will leave better. Yeah? You have learned something, you're, you have moved to a new level in terms of your understanding, in terms of your academic qualifications. So an institution must fundamentally change you for the better. So we have to ask ourselves, all those Ramadans that have passed in my life, am I that many times better? So this time last year, just before Ramadan, if you made a comparison spiritually, in terms of your religion, in terms of your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your closeness to Him, your level of commitment to Islam, your worship, would you find yourself today better, the same, or worse? If you find yourself the same or worse, then there's a problem. There's a problem. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever's today is not better than his yesterday, this person is a loser. This person is in loss. So definitely the Muslim is the first from over 1,400 years ago who believes in and promotes continuous improvement. Nowadays they teach us, yeah, those who are studying engineering, those who are studying management, we talk all the time about continuous improvement. How can we improve? Yeah. Management is my area of expertise. I have bachelor's and master's in business administration. So this concept is a very Islamic concept. We must constantly be improving. We know we are not perfect and we will never be perfect. So there's always room to improve. Ramadan is a spiritual training ground where you need to move to a new level, improve. And it's a level that you intend to maintain for the rest of the year. This is important. So some people in the month of Ramadan, they say, brother, you will see, I will not smoke all of Ramadan. I will not drink alcohol. I will not have relations with my girlfriend. I will not do this. I will not do that. MashaAllah. These are things that you should not be doing all the time. Not only in Ramadan. So Islam is not something that's linked to a certain time or a certain place. I'm a good Muslim on Friday prayer time. I'm a good Muslim in Ramadan. I'm a good Muslim when I'm in Mecca. No. A Muslim is somebody that fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is God conscious and righteous all the time and everywhere. So Ramadan is something that needs to develop that in our life. Now experts in personal development and change, they said for a person to improve, number one, they need to have a vision. And our vision is very clear, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ Whoever narrowly misses is saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the hellfire, because in actuality everybody could be going there, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save people by His mercy, by His grace, by His love. He will guide people and He will enter them into paradise. That is true success. Regardless of what you can amass in this life, regardless of how nice your car is, how big your house is, how much you have in your bank account, whatever title you have before your name, and we strive hard in this life for that, none of that is true success. It's temporary. What you have in this life will perish, will vanish, it will not last forever. Regardless of how long you enjoy it, a time will come where you will be separated from it. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for us in the hereafter is timeless will remain forever and will be far greater than anything we can enjoy in this life. So someone who has this vision, necessarily scholars who talk about personal development and change, they said if you don't make changes in your life, even small ones, you will never reach your vision. You will never achieve it. Somebody says, for example, I want to be someone who prays on time. So I need to start, for example, getting up for Fajr. Getting up for Fajr means you don't sleep at 3 a.m. And then say, how come I couldn't get up at 
You have to sleep earlier. Sleeping earlier necessarily means when your friends called you at midnight and said, let's go to the shisha bar and hang out for three or four hours, you said, I cannot. Definitely, I need to get up for Fajr on time. It's a small decision that you have to make, that you have to change, and it can have a profound effect on your daily schedule and the rest of your life. That's why those who talk about, for example, losing weight, getting in shape, improving your life in any way, they said you need to make small changes. But then you need to commit to those changes. Now we see people make those changes in Ramadan. They do things they never thought they could do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you for these 12 hours, 15 hours, water is in front of you, but you say, I will not drink it, and you need it for life. Then definitely the rest of the year you can say no to drugs and alcohol, because you've proven to yourself you have the strength, you have the willpower, you can have the patience, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we develop in Ramadan is meant to continue on after Ramadan. If you don't have that intention, then you're entering the month of Ramadan with an incorrect attitude and an incorrect state of mind. So you need to ask yourself, did I approach this Ramadan? Was my dua, oh Allah, may this be the best Ramadan that I've ever experienced in my life? Yeah, we hope that the next Ramadan, and we ask Allah to bless us with many Ramadans to come, we hope that the, the next one will be even better. But this one, do you wish and hope that it will be the best one that you fasted and experienced and worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life thus far? Or is your dua secretly, oh Allah, maybe it will be over very quickly. Yeah, Because you feel that it's a burden and you feel that it's something that you just wish you could sleep all day and stay up all night and flip your entire schedule around as some people begin to view Ramadan incorrectly as some kind of a burden rather than seeing it as the wonderful opportunity that it was. Now the Prophet Sallallahu he understood how great Ramadan was that in the hadith it's mentioned that he was making dua a couple of months before Ramadan asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that he may that he may reach, that he may witness, that he may live through Ramadan. That's how great and important it was in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They mentioned that some of the Tabi'een and the Sahaba, six months before Ramadan, they were asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let them live to catch Ramadan. Can you imagine? Six months before they're already thinking about it. When the beginning of Sha'ban came, some of them, they already closed their businesses and they took vacation for Sha'ban and Ramadan because of how great it was and how much they wanted to prepare ahead of time. The next five months after Ramadan, what do you think their dua was in relation to the month of Ramadan? What do you think their dua was the five months following Ramadan. What's the important thing to ask for? Don't be scared. There's no wrong answer. I won't tell you, you know, you failed. Or, huh? We're in a university. Students are always scared of the right answer, wrong answer. Acceptance, yeah? Acceptance. They are begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because no matter how much effort you put and time and energy, you have no guarantee that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it from you. So they were hoping and wishing that all the sacrifices they had made during that time would be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want you to think about something. You know, we have uh, in America, sometimes there are game shows. The winner of the game show, they tell him you will be given a limited time, 30 seconds. You can spend it inside of a, a small closet or a room, and there's a wind machine that's blowing, and they will release cash into the room. And they will say, grab as much money as you can in those 30 seconds. This is your prize for winning the competition. Everything you're holding and it's on your body or in your pockets, it's yours. You get to keep it. Now imagine those 30 seconds, they will go by in the blink of an eye. The person will say, it wasn't enough time, I wish I had more. And they will not even blink their eyes if they can stop from doing it during those 30 seconds. They want to take advantage as much as they can. Now imagine if you were given 30 days. 30 days, here's a sack, many sacks, fill it up with as much money as you can. Gather as much as you can. Do you think the person will rest? 
Do you think the person will be lazy, will say, I'm tired, I don't feel like it, and the millions are sitting there, they can take as much as they want, then they can relax after that for eternity? They would never do it. They would never let a, a moment pass by in that month. But yet you find some of us, Ramadan comes, and he, mashallah, shows how much he can sleep, how much TV he can watch, how lazy he can be. Why? What is this? This is an opportunity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you where the ajr is there by the millions for the taking. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you chances after chances to have your sins forgiven, to start over. Imagine if you could take it back. All the mistakes you have made, the wrong things you have done, it's a great opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet some of us still, we didn't appreciate it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when talking about things like this, he says, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَٰلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِّمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His grace, His bounties, His guidance, His reward, these things are the things that people should be overjoyed about. These are the things that should really make you happy. Why? They're far greater, far better than anything you can gather, you can collect in this life. Whatever money, whatever position, whatever power, whatever property, whatever you might be able to attain in this life, it cannot compare to these blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only gives to the ones that He loves. While worldly things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give them to everyone. Those who He likes and those who He don't, doesn't like. Those who are good and those who are bad. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he narrated in a famous hadith that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when talking about the month of Ramadan. He said, there has come to you Ramadan, a blessed month. Allah has made it obligatory upon you to fast this month. During it, the gates of paradise are opened. How many gates to paradise? Seven wrong. The exam so far, two questions wrong, huh? How many? Eight. Eight gates to paradise. And the gates to hellfire are locked, are closed. How many gates to hellfire? Seven. Yeah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month literally changes things in this universe. Yeah? Changes things during this entire month, making it easier for people to do good. The Prophet sallallahu said, and the devils are chained up. The leaders, the worst of the devils and most rebellious, are literally chained up, making it easier for people to do good. The Prophet ﷺ says, in it, there is a night that is better than a thousand months. Better. That's better than 30,000 days. Means whatever you do in that night will be multiplied by more than 83 years. Can you imagine? Then the Prophet ﷺ gave us what I was alluding to the entire time. The Prophet ﷺ said, And whoever is deprived of its goodness has indeed been deprived. Mahroom. Yeah? Who is the person that is really deprived? We say, Miskeen, he, he failed the exam. He didn't get the scholarship. He didn't get the job with the multinational company he wanted. He didn't get married, he didn't get that car, he didn't get this, and we say somehow he's been deprived. No, that person is not the one who's truly deprived. The one who's truly deprived is the one who lives through these opportunities, these blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he let it pass him by, he wasted it, he didn't take advantage. It's such a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet ﷺ actually made dua against people who live through Ramadan and they don't have their sins forgiven. So the Prophet ﷺ, one day he was climbing the mimbar, he was climbing the pulpit in the masjid, he was taking step by step. Each step he said, Ameen, 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 three times. The Sahaba are watching. Later they asked him, they said, O Messenger of Allah, we heard you say Ameen. But obviously there was no dua, they didn't hear a dua. When you say Ameen, it's in response to a prayer, to a supplication. The Prophet ﷺ said, The angel Jibreel ﷺ came to me and said, I'm going to make dua, so say Ameen. And he made dua against three people, three categories of people. 
The first category are those who hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned and they don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They don't send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's the least you can do because you are Muslim today. You have received the guidance from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because of his efforts, because of his sacrifice so many years ago Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two are those who their parents, one of them or both of them, live to old age and the person doesn't enter paradise through them, because of them. What does that mean? That means these elderly parents are a great blessing and opportunity for you by taking good care of them, by being kind to them, by being obedient to them, that you will earn great rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will earn your place in paradise. So the Prophet Sallallahu made dua, may they be losers, those who do not take good care of their parents when they are elderly. And number three, of course you have to be good to your parents all the time, whether they are young or old, but especially in their older age, this is a time when they are fragile and you are still young and healthy and strong, you owe it to them to take good care of them. Number three, the Prophet Sallallahu made dua along with the angel Gabriel against those who live through Ramadan and they don't get their sins forgiven. Why? It sounds quite dangerous, quite difficult. How many opportunities do we have in Ramadan to have our sins forgiven? Is it that easy for every Muslim to have their sins forgiven? The reality is the Prophet ﷺ told us about at least three opportunities we have to have all of our sins forgiven. Can anyone tell me about one of them? It's quite popular, quite famous, should be well known by every Muslim. I cannot hear. Before breaking fast, what do you do? Before breaking fast, you have a dua, you have a supplication that will be answered inshallah and you could pray to have your sins forgiven. This could be one way, but this is not one of the three I'm referring to. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever fasts the month of Ramadan, something that every Muslim, male and female, who's reached the age of puberty and is sane and capable, meaning they are not sick, they are not traveling and so on, then they must fast the entire month of Ramadan. This is something that applies to almost every single one of us. So every Muslim who fasts the month of Ramadan fulfilling two conditions, we will talk about those two conditions shortly, the Prophet ﷺ said they can have all of their sins, previous sins forgiven. This is referring to minor sins, minor sins, major sins, major crimes, they require repentance, they require tawbah, individual tawbah. Yeah? And tawbah, repentance has its conditions. Now, a second opportunity, which is one that all of us can do as well, the Prophet Wasallam said, مَنْ قَامَ رَمَضَانْ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ Whoever prays Qiyam, what is Qiyam prayer? It's extra prayers we do at night. What is considered Qiyam prayer? Anything you do after Isha prayer, before Fajr. So if you pray Taraweeh, this is one name we give to it, yeah? If you pray Tahajjud at the end of the night, if you pray Qiyam al these are three names for the same thing. Any prayer you do as Sunnah prayer, which is after Isha, before Fajr, time comes in, whether it's at the beginning of the night, the middle of the night, the end of the night, inshallah, you will be considered from those who is praying Qiyam. And if you do Qiyam every single night, now does Qiyam have to be in the masjid? No can be at home. Does it have to be in a congregation? No, you can do it alone. So no one has any excuse if you spend at least 10-15 minutes even praying your witr, praying some rak'ahs, inshallah you can be from those who has prayed Qiyam al -Layn. Now whoever prays Qiyam every night during the nights of Ramadan can have all of their sins forgiven if they fulfill the same two conditions. We will talk about them shortly. What's the third opportunity? Does anyone know? It's praying Qiyam on a special night. Which night is that? So whoever prays Qiyam al -Layl on Laylatul Qadr. Now if you pray Qiyam al -Layl every night during the nights of Ramadan, 
Are you guaranteed to catch Laylatul Qadr? Yes. Laylatul Qadr is one of the nights of Ramadan and most likely during one of the last 10 nights. So if you've prayed every single night, then inshallah you will also be from those who falls into the third category. They prayed Qiyam during Laylatul Qadr. Three opportunities to have all of your sins forgiven. If still you cannot take advantage of that, then you are in big trouble. Yeah? The Prophet Sallallahu told us, prayer to prayer, Friday prayer to Friday prayer, Ramadan to Ramadan, Umrah to Umrah, Hajj to Hajj, all of these, they are forms of kafara, expiation. They cleanse us from the sins we may have done in between. Look at how many opportunities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us. Look at how merciful and kind He is. Now, the Sahaba, they understood how great Ramadan is. Why? Another added benefit and bonus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us during the month of Ramadan. Imam al-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, during the month of Ramadan, a caller calls out. A caller calls out. O oh, you who want good, proceed. And O oh, you who want evil, cease, stop. You couldn't stop in Sha'ban, the month we are in now. You couldn't stop in Raja. You couldn't stop in any of the months of the year. At least in Ramadan, you have to stop. Ramadan is a time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easier for us to be good. So if you do not and cannot repent in Ramadan, then you're in trouble. Ramadan must be the time where we hold ourselves back. Wallahi, young brothers, they come to me, they said, Ramadan after Ramadan, and I'm committing zina through the whole thing. A'udhu billah. We ask Allah to protect us. If Ramadan is not the time where we can stop, then I'm afraid we will fall into the category where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, have you seen those who took as their God, the object that they worship and obey as slaves, their own desires, their own whims. They cannot control themselves. Their desires said have sex, they do. Their desires said drink alcohol, they do. Their desires said don't pray, they don't pray. So this person became a slave to their own self. They worship their own self actually, rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who created them. And the Prophet sallallahu then went on to say in this hadith, Allah frees people from the hellfire, and this is done every night until Ramadan is over. May Allah make us from them. There are some people, may we not be amongst them, we are destined for hellfire. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of sincerity that's in us, because of a sincere repentance, because of some good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to guide us, to save us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take that person who was destined for hellfire, and the reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a place in hellfire for every single one of us. And He's created a place in paradise for every single one of us. The Prophet sallallahu said, when a person dies in their grave, they will be shown both. And they will be told, this is the place you could have gone. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you if you were a true believer. And this is the place that you will be going. And the person will be overjoyed from what they have been saved from. The other person, it will be the opposite. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show them, this is where you could have gone. But this is where you are going because you rejected and you denied and you turned away. You refused to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the great blessings of the month of Ramadan. Now Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when talking about fasting, He said, Ayyaman ma'dudat. It's a counted limited number of days. Wallahi, I'm standing here now. I'm telling you Ramadan is about to start and it will seem like less than a week and someone will be here saying, brothers and sisters, Ramadan is over, and Eid is here, and may Allah help us to remain steadfast and good Muslims after Ramadan, and as if it just went by in the blink of an eye. Wallahi, I can still remember the masajid I was in this time last year, giving them lectures about Ramadan, and now an entire year passed, and it's as if it was a month or less, nothing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that as Ramadan is accounted limited number of days, so too is your life. Tie it up and put your trust in Allah. Yeah? 
You don't just don't do anything and then say, I don't understand how it didn't work out. So two, you have some great intention for Ramadan. Where is your plan? Where is your plan? Your plan needs to be operation valuable time. May Allah protect us. This Ramadan came with FIFA World Cup. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja. It's a big catastrophe for me. Yeah? How many a Muslim is going to spend how many an hour watching FIFA? Ya yeah, akhi, watch the highlights. See the goal. Don't miss tarweeh because of FIFA. You are staying up all night. In the daytime, you said, I cannot read Quran. I'm sleeping. The whole thing was because of FIFA. I'm on Facebook. I'm doing this. So you have to have some kind of a plan. How are you going to schedule your time? Reduce or eliminate watching things like TV and movies, listening to music, spending it on Facebook, this one, that one. There's no way you can expect to benefit from Ramadan if you don't have a plan. You, see, you saw what I mentioned about the righteous. They planned their annual leave for Ramadan. They took Sha'ban and Ramadan off. Business closed. The rest of us, we are all planning the vacation when? For Eid and after, not before. While the righteous person will say the last 10 nights, that's the time when you take off. They said the Prophet ﷺ in the last 10 nights, he didn't sleep at all. He will pray Qiyam al-Layl all night, every night. Can you imagine? The rest of Ramadan, he wouldn't do that. But in the last 10 nights, he will squeeze himself, making i'tikaf for 10 nights. That's 24 hours staying in the masjid for 10 continuous days and nights to the point that when he wanted to wash his hair, he stuck his head out the doorway and his wife washed it for him. He didn't want to put his whole body out. He wanted to keep himself in the masjid. Can you imagine? Detaching from the worldly life completely. Why? to spiritually elevate and excel. You want to improve spiritually without any sacrifice, without any effort or energy. You don't expect it to happen for your body. You don't expect it to happen for your mind without putting some effort. And so too, if you want to lose weight, become strong, uh, get a good education, you have a plan. So if you want to benefit from Ramadan, you have to have a plan. What are some of the things we can do? Number one, from now, before Ramadan starts, we make a sincere, repentance so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us to really benefit from Ramadan to catch Laylatul Qadr to accept it from us to have our sins forgiven number two making dua before and during Ramadan the beautiful verse of Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah talking about dua Allah is telling us he's so close when you call on him he answers your call as long as you do what as long as you answer his call. What's his call? What's the call of Allah? Hayya <laughs> al-Salah is part of it. The call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is be a Muslim. Submit to Allah. Do what he asked. Stay away from what he forbid as best you can. That's it. That's the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you answer his call, then he will answer yours. Some people say, I made dua and Allah doesn't answer. Allah promised he will answer. The problem is you, not him. Not him. You don't look to his side and blame him. Blame yourself. So the reality is, dua, this beautiful verse talking about dua, came in Surah Al-Baqarah right in between verses talking about fasting and Ramadan. So Ramadan is that time when you should be making dua and hoping for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer it. We know the dua of the person who's fasting is answered, more likely, and also at the time specifically right when you're about to break your fast, your fasting is more likely to be answered. Number three, rejoicing at the approach of the blessed month. As we said, some people are saying, Ramadan is coming. Oh Allah, make it fast and easy. No, this is not the spirit you should have. People are happy about their seasons, other religions. You see how they celebrate, how they decorate, how they prepare. Christmas, New Year's, birthday, Valentine's Day, garbage day. I don't know, so many days. Allahu Akbar. Allah Akbar. Days they have no meaning in the eyes of Allah whatsoever. Whatsoever. Complete fabrications, complete lies. As, as, as they say in America, some of them were made up by the greeting card industry. You know, Hallmark is a company that make greeting cards. They wish there will be a day for everything. Why? You will come and spend money and buy and you will give a card and so on. So there's only one day a year where the Muslim will say, I love you, my mother. I love you, my spouse, my children, thank you for this, thank you. Only one day, the Muslim should be doing this every day, ajib. So now, this is a season 
That's a real season. It means something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe. So we should be overjoyed and rejoicing at the coming of this great opportunity and season. Number four, discharging the duty of any obligatory fasting that you may have missed last year. So you would find that the righteous, Aisha radiallahu anha, for example, said, before Ramadan would come at the end of the year, she would make up the days. So especially for our sisters that may have missed some days last year, this is an important thing to take into consideration. Obviously, talking about it now is a bit late. Number five, seeking knowledge, reviewing what are the rules of fasting, what are the virtues of Ramadan, what are the ahkam, having some basic understanding. This is an obligation upon every Muslim. As you know how to pray, you must also know how to fast and what are the rules and the do's and the don'ts. Number six, completing any tasks. Uh, shopping for the Hari Raya, for Eid, and this one and that one. You do these things actually before Ramadan even begins. So in Ramadan, you don't end up wasting your time. We found Ramadan in some countries is, uh, uh, let me download the schedule of what uh, Musal Salat are going to be on TV, Bab al Hara, and this one and that one, and whatever famous uh, uh, series so that we can schedule our time around it and then we will spend marathon cooking session for our sisters five six hours the budget for food in ramadan doubles Haji, it should be the opposite you have more free time you do less cooking less eating and all of that so make sure that you try to finish those tasks and schedule your life to really benefit from it sitting with your family your friends your loved ones during ramadan having a small circle with your housemates have a nice book about Islam that you can read from for a few minutes every day as a reminder to get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, obviously, before Ramadan even comes in, we found the righteous, they would be fasting in Sha'ban, they would be giving charity, they would be reciting Quran, preparing. And once Ramadan came, they would turn up the volume. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah, they said, and I will end with this, in the month of Ramadan, he recited the entire Quran from beginning to end, 60 times, 60 times. That means he would recite the entire Quran one time in the day from the Mus'haf, and then he would recite it again an entire time in Qiyam prayer at night. Can you imagine? The Prophet ﷺ himself in his Qiyam al-Layl, in one rak'ah, he would recite five and a half juz of Quran. If the Imam in the whole tarweeh at night 23 rak'ahs, he recites one juz, the people said, come on, ya shaykh, take it easy. You're hurting us. Why? Have mercy, the people are, you know. The Prophet ﷺ would read five and a half juz. They said he would never connect the verses. He will separate every verse. He will read slowly. And every time he comes to a place, for example, of tasbih, he will stop and make tasbih. Every time he comes to a place talking about good, he will ask Allah for that good. Every time he comes to a place where there's something scary, a punishment, he will stop and ask Allah to protect him from it. That's how he recited the Quran in Salah. Can you imagine how long it would take him? Then they said he made ruku'ah almost as long as he was standing. So if he stood for two hours, he will make ruku'ah almost for two hours. Yeah? That's how he could actually stay sometimes praying for nine hours, ten hours. He will be praying just those eight rak'ahs of Qiyam al Something unbelievable. We are not even close to that level. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to overlook our shortcomings, to forgive us for uh, our heedlessness and our ungratefulness. But we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and accept the little good that we do, to make it sincerely for His sake, and to make this Ramadan the best Ramadan that we've ever experienced thus far in our life, and for it to be something in which we will maintain the good that we established during that month, even after the month is over. Jazakumullah khayran, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.